All right, I think we're going to start again. So I'm going to do the introduction here. Um, and we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, so we're really thrilled and, and um, thrilled and pleased to have uh, Professor Christine Boardman, who is the Presidential Professor of Information Sciences at UCLA. I've worked with Chris on a number of other projects. She's one of the, I would say, the leading authorities and experts in scientific data sharing in the in the world. She's all over the place giving uh, distinguished lectures and looking at not just the technology, but really the culture and why people share and what makes data valuable. So I won't take any more of Chris's time. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you, Carl. This is a, a great opportunity to be here with people who are down and dirty with the hard problems of data sharing and reuse. Uh, we've got two members of my research team here, uh, Milena Olshin and Irena. Okay, and they'll be around through dinner tonight and for part of tomorrow also. And I'll tell you about ours in a minute. Um, the other is this image has been kind of virtual until two days ago. The book is out. Okay. 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 okay, so that is uh, the latest on uh, issues. There's a very long chapter there on just uh, the issues of data sharing, uh, data sharing and reuse, which I hope you'll find uh, very useful. Uh, this is briefly who we are, and under this and uh, other data practices, we've been studying uh, data sharing, reuse, and changing uh, nature of scientific practices around uses of data for oh, the better part of 15 years now. Uh, funding from, uh, National Science Foundation, Microsoft, and others, and we've been funded by Sloan, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for the last three years, and we're in the midst of submitting a new proposal for another three years, and we're looking for another partner, and Carl has asked that we uh, look very closely to see if we could partner with uh, FaceSpace as a place to look at what some of these kinds of data sharing issues are. Uh, right now, we have been looking, we were uh, 10 years inside the Center for Embedded Network Sensing, an NSF Science Technology Center. I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Uh, two different projects in astronomy, very big data, not the kinds of human subjects issues that you have, uh, but certainly the, the long-term infrastructure issues and the mix of big groups and small groups that you have. Uh, the Center for Dark Energy and Biosphere Investigations, based at USC, also an NSF Science Technology Center, does have some very interesting multidisciplinary data sharing issues that are not unlike some of what uh, you are facing. Uh, when we talk about knowledge infrastructures, we're talking about what's this big technological, social, <laughs> cultural frame uh, that we're trying to work, what does that be in place for technology, for policy, not just Carl's beautiful interface designs and database engines behind them, but what, what kind of pipes, what kinds of decisions do you make about moving the data to your analysis, moving your analysis to the data, uh, what are your campus policies going to be? Now, it might be something gorgeous like this from our collaborator, Alyssa Goodman in Harvard Astronomy, where you've got Vermeer's astronomer in the middle, and you've got the data and tools on one side, and you've got the books and the libraries on the other. Uh, what we know is infrastructure is way messier. It looks a lot more like this. It is string, it is bailing wire, it is old technology, it is new technology. It is people in different countries, in different jurisdictions, different universities trying to knit these many pieces together. Uh, this is from a Sloan and NSF workshop we did a couple of years ago. There's a website to go with it. Uh, you'll find some good background there. Um, I'm talking a bit fast because I don't want to leave enough time for, uh, for some discussion and questions. Um, how many of you have been to a Research Data Alliance meeting? Melissa, <laughs> okay, I wouldn't guess Melissa. How many of you have heard of the Research Data Alliance? Okay, a couple more. Uh, I was at the se September meeting in Amsterdam, 550 people from 40 countries. This is a group that's come together from around the world, and the fact that you are on the ground and not really familiar with this movement is itself tells you how disconnected some of the sets of relationships are. Uh, and this is what I was talking uh, to them about 
is their notion that they're going to reduce barriers presumes that researchers are going to share their data in the first place. And as you have learned by now, that is not an easy thing to do. So the, the difficulties fall into at least uh, these, these four categories. The first is what's the, the reward structure. Second is what, uh, who takes what kind of responsibility. Third is what kind of data are we talking about really. And fourth, about how those come together in incentives. So let's just talk very briefly about rewards. These will vary considerably from field to field, but for the most part, the reward structure is around your publications. That's what you get hired for. That's what you get tenure for. Uh, in some areas, you may get credit for building algorithms and technology. In some, you may get credit for curating really beautiful, gorgeous data that other people are going to reuse. I'm always asking deans how often they have promoted people based on the quality of the data they provide. The answer is usually zero. But, you know, that, that's not, so here we are asking people to make massive investments in their data for other people to reuse them and that there's some real disconnect here about the reward system. Secondly is the question of who takes uh, responsibility. And you take one of the reasons publications are so central is that publications are peer reviewed. That's how you legitimize your work. That's how you take responsibility for it. And that is the long term record. But the publications are not simply containers of data. You can make the same argument with different data. You can use the same data to make different arguments. And the history of scholarly communication shows that data and publications are not, um, are not equivalent. Here's a, a snapshot of the ways in which they are different uh, that affects the sharing responsibility. Publications, your journal articles are intended to be readable as independent units. You should be able to pick up a journal article and provided you've got the background in the field, be able to make sense of it. It shouldn't have to say, go and look at these five prior articles to get the research methods. It's got to be sufficiently <coughs> self-contained. You negotiate the authorship of who's going to be first, second, third, last. We also find that this varies considerably. In some fields, the first author is the most important. Other fields, the last author is the most important. In yet others, the corresponding author is most important. And these tend to be highly negotiated. We have not really matured in data sharing to a point where people are doing much in the way of negotiation about who was an author of data. We have an entire dissertation by Jillian Wallace out of uh, my group where we started asking people who were the authors of their data and the, the whole term of authorship didn't even resonate at all. So we really got into who's who's responsible, who takes the risk, who's supposed to release it, at what point can you release the student. Uh, data associated with PhDs, and so on. Data are compound objects. They're rarely intended to be completely intelligible on their own. You need that metadata. You need the curation. You often need the algorithms, the instrumentation. We've already had examples this morning of how you need to tie together different kinds of observations, different kinds of imagery, different kinds of genomic information from different places. And unless you can integrate them, no single piece of that may be very, um, very useful. So the ownership is rarely clear. And we need to get some kind of attribution. If it's not authorship, then it's some kind of attribution and giving credit. The long-term responsibility tends to fall to the investigators. That's who has the most stable address. Uh, but if you want to get back to the data to find out how it actually was collected, what protocols were around it, maybe it's a student, maybe it's the postdoc, maybe it's some of the camera technicians, maybe it's some of the other people. So that, that's part of the funny mix that's in here as well. Um, little known fact is that universities often claim the ownership I mean, look at this here. The University of California claims ownership on the data produced by the investigators. That might be a good thing if it means they're going to take long-term responsibility for it. It might not be a good thing when you want to say, these data I'm going to share under this grant with these collaborators in this other country, and you actually need to negotiate with. This is really very new territory. 
we have an international a working group that's been underway for oh, at least five years now trying to come up with models and standards for citation and attribution of data. And it turns out citation and attribution themselves are different things. It's not just a matter of mapping the particular bibliographic citation model into data. It's what's the granularity that goes with it. Do you cite the set? Do you cite an individual cell on a table? Do you cite the whole table? Do you cite the whole article? Do you cite the whole data set? We find people citing the entire Sloan Digital Sky Survey as one thing. So what, what is that? You end up with getting uh, things that look more like Hollywood cast lists like this uh, to figure out exactly who you're going to give credit for and how you're going to map them up. Underlying many of these issues is the disagreements or the lack of discussion on, on what are data in the first place. You will see I've devoted an entire chapter to the question of, of what are data in the book. Uh, because the, they're not bright, shiny objects. Uh, they're something that occurs when someone makes a scholarly argument about them. Um, that uh, lovely little mouse there, some of you are studying the facial features of similar ones, uh, but then all, other people are going to take that mouse and watch it run around a cage. They're going to feed it different things. They're going to uh, have many other interactions with it. It's what they do with it that becomes uh, that becomes the data. We're seeing, for example, in work with astronomy, people love these gorgeous pictures, but you rarely get those in astronomy journal articles because astronomers don't agree on red, green, and blue. There's a whole lot of artistry in what goes into all of those particular diagrams and um, information graphics. This is much more what data look like in astronomy, and parsing these Digitally is also a challenge. Notice that entire thing on the right is figure three. That might be a half a dozen different figures if you are going to try to parse them separately. And the ones <coughs> on the top uh, in the original PDF in 2009 could be rotated. This is the center that we spent 10 years with. About three-fourths of the participants were from computer science and engineering. The uh, rest of them were from various scientific application domains, quite a few from different kinds of biology and uh, field ecology. So a little bit of genomic data uh, with some of the oceanographers and uh, field researchers here. Uh, but we have sensors in the ground, in the water, in the sky, robots blasting in different, uh, different ways. And here we found even when people were working side by side, uh, on the same projects, collecting the same measurements in the field, they had very different ideas about what were their data. One very simple example is one of the engineering researchers uh, looking at the measurements coming off the sensors said, temperature's temperature. Biologists working right next to him, this is what this guy had to say about what temperature means. They didn't trust each other's measurements because they had very different standards within their fields. And this particular biologist needed to put three different instruments side by side for 365 consecutive days before he trusted a temperature measurement. He needed many more degrees of freedom than the engineer did. The engineer wanted to know how close it was to yesterday's measurement. That did not work for the biologist. But until we started coming along and asking these difficult questions, these things weren't really surfacing um, between them. The work that we've been doing with um, C. Debbie, another thing that uh, Carl is a, a partner on, uh, we're looking at this ocean drilling program to get this really big science, and a lot of it ends up in very small investigators, short-term projects and labs, but the negotiation over what becomes data it occurs very early. Who gets a seat on that boat? on that ship that goes out to sea. And once they start pulling up these cores from below the sea floor, what temperature are you going to store them at and how are you going to slice them or are you going to slice them? For microbi microbiological work, it's got to be stored at minus 80 centigrade. For physical sciences, at minus 4 centigrade. So as soon as you break them up and store them in a different place, it determines the future use of these data. <laughs> which takes us on to uh, the last grouping, which is the questions around incentives. And again, what you get rewarded for is much more about the publications 
than about making data that are reusable, particularly making data that are reusable for unknown other people uh, at some future point. Now, that's also what's very interesting to us about face space is these unknown future people actually are known. They're right here on the video screen. They, they are part of the <laughs> <laughs> They are watching closely about what data are going to be made available and thinking very specifically about how they might how they might make use of them. So looking at both sides of that partnership is uh, you know certainly part of what's interesting for us. And we're also we also look at things like the relationships of the many different kinds of um, information objects that get thrown off through the parts of a project. And this is part of that that lack of independence of you want to know what the experimental design looked like, what the protocol looked like, uh, different states of the data, different kinds of documentation. You need enough domain knowledge to know what's an artifact and what's a real observation and so on. Uh, metadata has been kind of tossed around um, sub rosa this morning. And I, I asked Carl uh, on the side which of the thousand definitions of curation he had in mind when he used curation. Um, and it was, well, sort of whoever puts metadata on it. And no ontology is perfect, nor will it ever be. But it's striking about, I mean, you're certainly confronting again head on, but each of the ontologies that you have to deal with is going to be internally consistent to your field and, and your species and other things. And yet you're also trying to get those to bridge across different kinds of, um, different kinds of communities. So it's going to make it easier to retrieve, but the more consistent you make your, your description to one kind of community, the more opaque it may be to another kind of community. You're going to make, be making some very challenging uh, decisions. And similarly, questions of provenance, which is a word I've not heard today. Is this a word you use much? You do. You do, okay. Um, well, in the database world, in the database world, it means yet something probably different than, than these three. The WC3 standards, uh, which are dealing with things like web pages and, and what's the origin of those things and those different parts. Um, the, the library and museum notions are much more linear, a sense of, you know, can the Getty trace when this object came out of the dirt somewhere? But then it also gets into where did the metal come from? Where did the metal craft happen? There's many, many different chains that you would want to follow. And as you start to merge data from different sources and keep the credit with it, keep the licensing as you go forward, keep the different IRB rules, keep the different ethical tags that need to go onto it, keep the data policies with it, all of those things enter into the, the challenges of the data sharing. Um, Lastly, more or less, around the incentives is this question of thinking long term about what we mean by reuse. Now, when we're saying, you know, these are the people contributing the data to face space, these are the people who are planning to reuse it, you know who those people are and you, you've got kind of a real time and you've got maybe a five year or so window that you're thinking about. The farther you go down this list, the greater the effort is going to be around that curation to make it useful for someone else. And how much investment is going to be made by the investigator, by a metadata specialist, by a librarian, or whomever farther down the line. Archives like to say their users have not been born yet. Is face space ready to uh, create data for users that have not yet been born? I somehow doubt it, but that's maybe farther than you want to think, but we need to be thinking about how far that goes. <coughs> um, I don't want to get too far into the economics, but to point to the kinds of things you're talking about in face space are very definitely common pool resources. These are uh, materials that are contentious enough that you need to have some kind of governance model. What are the rules by which people put things in? What are the rules by which people put things out? Who gets to govern the process? Who decides? And how do you um, how do you manage free riders? Because you put all this labor into making it useful. Who gets to use it? And what do you have to put in in return for what you're going to have to, to get out on the other side? So many governance issues to be dealt with. Um, just to, to promote the conversation, 
been, we've been generating some questions about some of the sharing and reuse challenges that it seems that the face-based community is going to have to uh, chew on if you haven't already. Uh, I've got four on this slide and, and um, three on the next. But I might just sort of throw them out there and say why I think they're important for you and maybe we'll use whatever time we've got left to talk about them. I think the first question is this notion of, of credit and responsibility, is who on the team is going to be uh, curating the data and who's going to get the scholarly credit for actually releasing these data and how are you going to reward people in this process. I think I've alluded to the second one already about how you're going to <coughs> deal with the inward facing models versus the outward facing models and it's going to be some kind of a balance uh, that's going to affect the scientific usefulness of your data depending on how you, you know, that's almost like a type one, type two error problem of which way you're going to go in tuning your, your integration between your ontologies, your interfaces, and just plain locating those data, spelunking through them as, as Carl was saying further. Um, when we say what are the data, thinking about specifically how much of those data are going to be uh, species data, image data, um, what part of it can you release without getting into certain kinds of, of ethical issues? Uh, we don't want, I was having an interesting side conversation, but can you uh, get to you know, NSA levels of confidentiality protection? And when we think about the longer term policies, are, are you thinking about curation around the level of one particular fixed term grant, or are you talking about changing the kinds of permissions where you can really reuse these data indefinitely and dealing with things like the reconsent process. And that's, of course, all up for grabs right now in your community. Um, think about the time horizons. Um, think about the value that you're going to gain by contributing. There's, there's certainly an argument to be made that your investments in your data by contributing them will mean that you're going to make certain kinds of uh, ways of thinking about your own reuse and maybe marking them up, making them more useful at the beginning. And similarly, to think about uh, what kinds of scientific value the people at the other end are going to be able to get and what kind of investments they're going to make. We've learned in the big data world that something like 80% of the effort goes into cleaning data before you can use it. Okay. It's often easier to collect your own data than it is to use somebody else's data. So we need to think about the investments on the ingest side and the investments on the output side. Uh, to what extent are the same people, the contributors and the users, and uh, who's going to make those investments and at what stages in the, in the process? Um, so I put our logos down there at the bottom. Um, I hope that generated a few points for discussion. Conversation. Um, so, people like Rich have IRB protocols for their specific projects to go take pictures of little kids. Does Face Face itself have legal permission to have these data on human subjects? Yes. Yes. How? Is, do they have their own IRB protocols? You have IRB approval for storing the human data, right? Correct. Yeah. Is there a blanket? What do you mean a blanket? Because you have to have permission for each specific data set, correct? No. So the face-based human data are stored in a HIPAA-compliant server okay. setup that Carl has arranged, uh, I guess, with the, ho with the hospital? Yes, at the hospital. At the hospital. But you don't need it since he's not got access to the individual level data in an identifiable fashion. Okay. Right? It doesn't need to go data set by data set. Okay. So does the ID identify that though? So the but question is, how can pictures be the ID identified? So this is an <laughs> interesting. So the so the question. I don't know if everybody could hear Jan's question, but this issue came up in face base one. If you take a picture of someone's face and it's a standard, you, know, you took it with your, with your iPhone, that picture is obviously identifiable. 
if you create a mesh, if you strip the texture off, some IRBs considered that de-identified, some IRBs considered identified. For face-based purposes, we considered that identifiable. Therefore, to get the data, uh, as an outside user, you have to go through a face-based data access committee. You have to have IRB approval to get the data. But Carl doesn't. Okay. Know, so the so user has to have that. All the all the human identify. We consider all the human data identifiable. Those data sets, except for stuff you get from dbGaP, like genotypes, <coughs> but all the pictures, all the have, they'll have to have IRB approval from their institution, and they go through a data access committee that Emily chairs. But this is a, I mean, but I think this is a great example of where the technology and the policy have to be very tightly integrated. And because this is coming directly from NIH, you've dealt with kind of capturing some of the policy issues upstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like uh, PubMed Central dealt with capturing the um, intellectual property issues upstream, which made it much easier on the ground to be able to deal with these things. But you've still got multiple jurisdictions and multiple IRBs that you've got to negotiate with, mm -hmm. and we've got to balance those things. So Actually, this particular issue, there is actually OHRP is to whom the investigator responds and the institution responds, not to NIH, technically. And OHRP has said that as long as subjects consent for example, for release of identifiable data to qualified investigators, that's fine. And at that point, they've consented, and that's what we do. Okay. Oh, I, you okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, that, so that's actually how all of these subjects are involved. Right. Okay. Yeah, we're very cautious of, about the consent forms yeah. to make sure that the subjects know what's being shared, right. it's going to be shared, and what actually is going to be shared. And what happens, I have to a question though. So most of these subjects <coughs> are, that we're enabling are children. Mm -hmm. The parents are signing for them, and there is an evolving standard as to who signs an assent form, and even does that substitute for consent, parental consent, even though an assent form has no legal standing. Um, but that aside, what happens if a kid reaches 18, finds out their picture is in face space, and then said, well, I didn't give consent for it? Depending on how this argument goes, you may have to reconsent them when they hit 18. This topic could go on for yeah. the right. rest of the day. Let's see about other questions. Mary? Did you have a question? I was going to make essentially the same comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> how about some of the other hard ones? This is definitely, this is a really intractable one, but you're to be dealt with. Different question. So I, I have a question. So you're a temperature fussy biologist. Yes. Right? Is what the temperature fussy biologist is asking for data or metadata? Temperature is temperature. It's how you got the temperature to me is metadata. Uh, what part of what this particular biologist is asking for is a level of measure, it's not just the metadata, but it's a level of measurement that um, goes to international standards, the kinds of things mm -hmm. that the co-data the co will govern and say, I trust it if it is within, you know, it has these particular characteristics, as opposed to your instrument that you built in the, that some grad student built in the lab, I don't, just because that number is stable from one day to the next, that's not a temperature measurement to me. And so that there's a professional disciplinary distinction between what is adequate. But I mean, an another example that we came across in SENS is water quality. And the Southern California Ocean Observing System uh, realizes that those surfers that you can almost see from here are measure, you know, they are checking the water every single day for water quality, whether it's safe enough to surf. Now, the people who are in the water quality management district, they won't trust those data for their particular purposes. But whether you want to go in the water now, there's reasons to trust that. So, so what temperature means is not a stable measurement. Mm -hmm. It's a different measurement for different purposes at different times. Well, it, in that sense, it's no different than someone else's gene expression data. 
in, in the sense. Of, but to me, temperature is, a, you know, if you look in the spreadsheet, temperature is a number. How you got that number is protocol yeah. and to be metadata. So. And time is up now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we will be around through dinner. Okay. Right. And they will be around tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.